Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. You know, they say that the legislative process is like making sausage. And every year it has a different flavor in the batch. Well, today on the county seat, we're going to take a, um, a, a period of time to talk to the chief sausage maker, uh, Speaker of the House, Greg Hughes. How Thank are you? Thank you, Representative. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm glad, glad to be here. We all saw the ingredients going in. And, and, you know, the topics that were supposedly going to be really big issues, um, obviously, going in were medical marijuana, indigent defense, uh, interest on sales tax, yes. and these were the big buzzwords before the session started. Obviously, it kind of took a different direction as it went through and we got a whole bunch of stuff out. That's right. How different was the perception of, of, of interest or importance inside the session from what we saw on the outside? So we have a lot of these shows that we do before the session begins, and this is where we try to, to you know, measure up what we're gonna be talking about, what the big issues will be. And um, I, I will tell you, I keep trying to describe it. It's like raging rapids. You, you get in your boat and it's going to take you and you kind of know your direction, but it's got a life of its own and every session does. And so you, you, you use your best eye about what you think will be the, the issues of the day, uh, but the session will take you in different courses. The, the issues, as you mentioned, uh, we had kind of that, that framework of, of indigent defense, um, the mer medical marijuana, the, um, there were a lot of them. Uh, medical marijuana was. It was probably one of the big, it probably sucked all the oxygen out of the room politically in terms of uh, the down, we do, we watch what bills are downloaded uh, or accessed on, on our government website and it was the most uh, frequently and most uh, downloaded bill was Senator Madsen's medical marijuana bill and Senator, Senator Vickers' mar medical marijuana bill. Um, but we had other issues, big issues that we dealt with with water. Water is not a campaign uh, flyer, at least in most legislators' districts, and, and it doesn't sizzle in terms of, di of issues that people pay attention to, but this is a desert state, and, uh, and our ability to plan for water projects, uh, maintain the existing infrastructure for, for water, uh, we have fallen behind as a state, and certainly the 50 years ago, the planning that allowed this state to grow as it has, um, we feel woefully behind in terms of our planning and preparation for the next 50 years. And so that became a really big issue uh, in the session as and well. And it was relatively quiet going in. I do notice, though, that, that you had a water infrastructure funding bill that yes. didn't make it. So we had a couple, but we did. So we do have the bills that we needed to pass. We had one that failed, but we brought it back. Mm -hmm. uh, we had two bills that did, that did pass. So the one that uh, Representative Perry had originally, that bill did not go through. Senator Adams had two bills. He had a, we identified a funding source, mm -hmm. and then we had a bill that will help uh, help us master plan or with all the water districts participation, show which projects are the highest priority and where dollars can be borrowed from this fund. And then as they're paid back, it kickstarts the next project or the next district's needs. And uh, we did get those two bills passed, and that was a big and heavy lift. And uh, the way we did that is really with the example of the water districts across the state, Typically, they come into a session and it's like crabs in a bucket. A water district has uh, a water project for their specific area of the state, and the other districts say, well, wait a minute, what about us? And the other legislators that aren't from that area of the state say, well, wait a minute, what about us? This year was very different. All the water districts came arm in arm and said, we want a comprehensive plan that will meet all of our needs. And so now you're involving all the different areas of our state, all the lawmakers uh, in the House and Senate that would be worried about water infrastructure, we're seeing a way forward. And we're trying to make up for a federal government that's really left and vacated this space um, and are not uh, lending for water infrastructure projects like they used to. The state can't, um, can't do it on our own, but we're now making great progress. All right, well, we're gonna take a quick break there. We'll come back. Stay with us, we're on the county seat with Speaker Greg Hughes. Kanab, base camp for your Southern Utah adventures. You belong in Kanab. There's a little place where I was raised, where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows. 
wild and high And the stars come out at night Oh, there ain't nothing like Being raised in the basin with the youth reservation Skin starvation That Duchesne County life Shopping in Davis County has never been better. Experience Station Park, Northern Utah's premier gathering place for shopping, dining, and entertainment. With over 100 shops, Station Park is something for the whole family. Or explore the shopping possibilities this season under one roof at the Layton Hills Mall. Both are conveniently located north of downtown Salt Lake, just off I-15. Come take advantage of special discounts and a wide selection of stores. Visit PlayInDavis.com for more info. The Utah Farm Bureau has always been there to fight for the needs of its members. With discount programs on items ranging from vehicles and ATVs to health and wellness. The membership fees aren't big, but the results are. We've been around since 1916, and we're not leaving anytime soon. Utah Farm Bureau. We work for those who work to feed the world. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about the legislative session as it relates to counties. We're talking with Speaker Greg Hughes. Uh, I, I do have a question for you. Many of the rural counties were really concerned about centrally assessed taxes, and it's a sticky wicket. And they were looking, going into the session, they wanted to do some modification on the appeals process. Coming out of the session, we have this big motion by, driven by Rocky Mountain Power to do an accelerated depreciation on property and centrally assessed taxes. How did that, how did that go from this direction to that direction? What, what well, happened? Welcome to the 2016 general session, okay? Yeah. Um, I, I, I will <clears throat> tell you that uh, the, the, the policies and the issues that we take on uh, can change course very quickly. Um, the centrally assessed issue is one that I understand and I know there was uh, great momentum. Rocky Mountain Power, it had a, they're trying to do some transitioning in terms of some of their, uh, the way they generate power mm -hmm. and how they're able to um, depreciate their current assets. And they had, a, they had a comprehensive plan, but it wasn't, as, it wasn't consistent with some of the other conversations that had happened. An example of that also would be this. You have uh, medicinal marijuana. And that is a, that's been a hot topic and people have said, hey, we should be able to, to use it. it. It has a medicinal uh, quality to it. But at the same time, we wanted to take um, e-cigarettes, which is a legal product, and say, how can we tax this out of existence? And how can we make this legal product uh, and make sure that people, that the cost and the sales tax so high we can't use it? And they aren't philosophically um, uh, very consistent. You can take even the freedom, uh, the food freedom bill that Representative Roberts ran that the Farm Bureau didn't like. And that was kind of co-ops where you could sell food and that you were kind of going around uh, an infrastructure of inspections and safety. and people were worried about that. You can take these different bills in terms of um, something that's illegal that we'd like to be legal under the banner of, you know, freedom to do what you want to do here in the state of Utah and as a citizen of the country, let's not let government, you know, be your nanny. Uh, and then you take a food freedom bill, same people that might like this one might think, well, we need some more uh, regulatory climate around food and how you buy and sell it. And, and so I, I think uh, your observation is correct. I don't think that we stay as much as we'd like to uh, on the same philosophical path uh, in, the, in the policies that we pursue. Centrally assessed is probably one of the biggest thing to rural counties because it affects them so much. Does that pass over into the legislature? You know what, um, it, it is an issue that we know about. I'm a suburbanite. I live in Draper, Utah. The, um, the, it's, not, it's not as a, a, a big issue, but we feel it. We feel from our, my colleagues I serve with that this is an issue. And I think it's one that we'll continue to address and we'll drill down on. And um, we've got a great tax and rev committee uh, that will really look at these things. And we put people on that committee to really drill down on the policy. So uh, it will continue to be, a, I think, a hot topic here in our legislative sessions. Well, what other, what other hot topics? So here's the thing about our legislative uh, process. There are things that I think that Utahns, rural, urban, suburban, wake up every day and they need. And they're just basic. Uh, things that we've come to expect from the state of Utah, and that is um, we need good schools to send our kids to. Mm -hmm. We gotta know that our kids are gonna be ready uh, in our, as future workforce to be ready in a global economy. Uh, we're gonna go to work, so we better have roads that can get us where we need to go, and we better have an infrastructure, a transportation infrastructure that 
uh, not only do you get to work, but the goods and services you may provide in your employment can successfully uh, be done on our transportation infrastructure. Uh, you have water in an arid state where when we turn on that faucet, when our rural uh, and our agricultural sectors are depending on water, we need to make sure it's there. And those are issues that, again, I, I think we start to look at the marijuana or we look at the death penalty or we look at these issues that have a lot of, uh, lot of conversation about them. But the bread and butter issues that I've talked about, education, transportation, water, infrastructure needs, uh, we work very hard on those. And I think that we've made great uh, strides. We've uh, moved the needle as we've come into that session and we've made great accomplishments uh, or made great progress. The other thing we do is we balance the budget and that's hard to do. A lot of people might think that you uh, cast away the dumb ideas of how to spend state dollars and you only fund the smart and the important things, but that's not the case. Many times with finite dollars, you're walking away from important uh, requests for appropriation that you'd like to do, but the, the dollars aren't there to do them and you have to really prioritize those dollars. Uh, that's, a, that's a lengthy exercise. Every member of our legislature goes through that in terms of sub-appropriation committees. Some states just have like a Ways and Means Committee. One committee decides it all and then you send it to the floor and you vote on it. We do it differently. We have our uh, Natural Resources Appropriations Committee. We have an Education Appropriations Committee, a higher ed uh, transportation. And so every lawmaker that I serve with has an area of expertise in our state budget and the decisions on how to put that budget together are hard. We do that and we do that with success and I think that that's something that we should talk about more often uh, than maybe the, the newspapers allow us to. There were uh, quite a few counties that were interested in this whole coal terminal process. And yes. It kind of it went ugly. It did, it um, did. But what's your take from the legislature on that? I, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't live in coal country, but I will tell you this, I know, that I know this state, I know it's a diverse state in terms of the different economic sectors we have in this state, and I know that Carbon County is coal country. And I know that it, it puts uh, food on the plates of uh, dinner at, for dinner and families throughout that county and throughout Utah. We have a clean coal in, in Utah, which means that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, if you have a coal-fired power plant anywhere in this world, you would do well to use and utilize Utah coal because, of its, because it's, it's clean. Um, I, I've heard all the, all the cynicism about uh, we did this because energy sectors uh, contribute money to our campaigns. I wouldn't know. The, 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 I heard it was Bowie um, Energy. I wouldn't know Bowie Energy from David Bowie, truly. I mean, I wouldn't know who they are because it wasn't part of our decision-making process. What we heard was Democrat Brad King from Carbon County make, stand up and make an impassioned plea for his district, for the men and women that work in this industry, for the opportunity to be able to export coal. Uh, he noted that China it has no intention of slowing down their, their power plants that are coal-fired power no, plants. They're building them at a huge rate. That's right. And if, you, if they were to use Utah's clean coal instead of the, the coal they use, which is a dirtier coal, their dirty air or their air emissions could be cleaned by 50% utilizing the coal from this state. That improves our economy. That can clean the air around the, around the world. And, uh, and so the opportunity, and this wasn't new money that the legislature appropriated, but to allow for those local funds that are generated to be committed to and to reserve a port where that exporting can occur more successfully, uh, that, is, that is a win for everyone. And, and so yeah, there are people that hate coal. There are people that hate natural resources and fossil fuels, but you can't, you can't give into that hype. You gotta do what you think is right. And I think that was uh, the right move for Utahns, it was right for the economy, and I think it will ultimately even improve uh, air quality around the world the more that Utah coal is uh, able to be utilized. And this is a good place for a break. We're having a very good conversation with Greg Hughes, Speaker of the House for the state of Utah. We'll be back right after this commercial break here on the county seat. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. 149 million years in the making, dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. 
Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. Beautiful scene, isn't it? The great wide spaces of the wild, wild west. Hi, I'm Chad Booth, host of At Your Leisure. I'm asking you to support the Blue Ribbon Coalition. Their efforts responsibly preserve access to our public lands. If it were not for the Blue Ribbon Coalition and their efforts, you may not have access to millions of acres of land across the West. This is America's playground, and if we don't do anything, we are going to lose it. Join, participate, and donate. What's the story of your life? What chapter are you on? Did you happen to get married recently? Perhaps you found your lost puppy at the animal shelter. Or you're taking an art class at the senior center. There's that flu shot that kept you well last season. And don't forget the museums and historical sites your family loves. And all the fun you have at the county swim center. County services from search and rescue to maintaining roads bring tremendous value to each of our lives. We're the Utah Association of Counties, helping you build the story of your life. Welcome back to the county seat. We're having a conversation with Greg Hughes, Speaker of the House for the state of Utah. What are some of the bills that you think are important bills that still have a lot of momentum that didn't get out of the session? So a bill that we, we <clears throat> spent a lot of time looking at, and uh, I think that we, not only the state of Utah, but the, this country has to deal with, and that is the sales tax for online purchases. When you purchase something online, uh, there already in the state of Utah is a tax, a sales tax you're supposed to pay. Now, if you go to a site, uh, that already collects the sales tax, that's great. But right now the law says that if you uh, spend money on a website uh, in an online purchase where they don't uh, charge that sales tax, you're supposed to pay that on your state income tax. And I don't know that the compliance is very high. Um, I had to go back and make sure that I was actually getting this done because you have a, a, a use tax line on your income tax that if you haven't been charged that sales tax, you're supposed to be paying it there on your income tax. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was a bill that would say that all these online retailers needed to start collecting the tax. And it wasn't a tax increase, it was a compliance issue of, of helping consumers who, pay, who buy things online to pay it in a way that's easier to comply with the law. Uh, there was a lot of opposition from tech companies in terms of putting the sales tax. And actually some of their arguments were valid in that uh, for a company that doesn't have a, 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 doesn't domicile out of this state or doesn't have a presence here, uh, and the, the lack of, or the sales not being very strong coming from a small state like this, it would be easier for them to not sell, sell or team up with bloggers or those that would, uh, they're called affiliates, that they would use. Um, it would just be easy to recoil than to try and pay that tax. And so what we were trying to do with that bill was really send a message to Congress. This is interstate commerce and, and Congress needs to deal with and come up with a way for that sales tax to be uh, collected and remitted to the states where it's due. And, but Congress hasn't done it. So what's happened is states have tried to come up with their own uh, system or own plan for doing that. And so we're cobbling together different states. It amounts to a message bill. And the reason why the bill did not pass is that you have a message bill and an important message because we're seeing our general sales tax where people used to go to brick and mortar stores for everything. We're seeing that sales tax and that revenue arriving the state shrinking. And so we know it's having an impact on our collection of sales tax. So we know we have to do something. And so the bill amounted to an important message to Congress saying, we're all gonna try to do it, but we'll never get it right like you should because you're the ones that really have the authority to get this done. But at the end of the day, it was, it was having the impact or had the potential of hurting some bloggers, some people that were deriving a revenue from those partners. An example, if you'd had a blog that talked about how you decorate a house, mm -hmm. you might have Home Depot or you may have other um, affiliates that they could click on to purchase things um, and when the and when a reader of your blog purchased something there the blogger would receive a revenue from that and the retail the online retailer would receive the the purchase um, it would have had the effect of taking some of those small businesses and wiping them out because those retailers were going to not make themselves available to Utah bloggers and those that would usually affiliate so it was that bill was going to come at a high cost to some people in the state and that was hard for us to to get our heads around. And so that is an issue that will not go away. Online sales tax is something that's owed in the state of Utah. Mm -hmm. um, the budget, it's a, it's a fairness issue, but how we are able to do that and how we accomplish that or how we message to Congress that they need to do it, that is a conversation that will continue to happen even though we were not able to land on a bill. Is there a fiscal note on this that talks about how much revenue we're missing by not collecting that sales tax? You know what there is, well, there's a, the, what the, there, there's a fiscal note, there's, a, there's an impact of, of, of tens of millions of dollars. 
um, which might not sound like a lot, but our surplus in the general fund this year was just 65 million total uh, for general fund that was in surplus or in excess to what we collected last year. Um, so there's there's a lot of, of dollars to be um, to be remitted or paid as per the law that we're not getting. The challenge was this. Um, you had people out there that just wanted to call that a tax increase. Hey, you're just trying to raise our taxes on the internet, an internet sales tax increase or a tax increase. Um, and the criticism um, really did slow down our ability to get that bill done. And, and as I said, um, the people that it would have detrimentally impacted was, was a problem. But make no mistake, we are losing sales tax revenue in this state and we're losing it at a greater and greater margin so we've got to do something about that okay great it's been a good conversation we'll continue with speaker greg hughes here on the county seat in just a minute have you ever wanted to recreate the world around you add some excitement culture adventure well there's no need to remake the world when that perfect combination already exists just remember four words welcome to weber county In Ogden, you'll find everything you're looking for, from the top of Powder Mountain to the restaurants of our revitalized downtown. Ogden, Utah. Mountain to metro and everything in between. Visit Ogden.com. There is a place where looking out means looking in. Where an impression lasting only a few seconds will be imprinted on a life forever. Where courage is forged and innocence rediscovered. Where remembering is rewarding and forgetting unforgettable. There is a place where truth is felt and where seeing is believing. There is a place. What do you picture when you hear Rich County, Utah? Bear Lake Adventure? Snowmobile action? Pristine skiing? Spectacular solitude? Well, if that isn't what first came to mind, then you just don't know Rich County. The Bear Lake Monster Polar Plunge. Snowmobiling Monte Cristo, ice fishing Bear Lake, skiing the backcountry, fishing at the Cisco Disco. Come and find out what you never knew you were missing. Rich County, Utah. Welcome back to the county seat. We're talking with Greg Hughes, Speaker of the House for the Utah State House of Representatives. Uh, we were on the topic of bills that that didn't make it that still need to be addressed. And I know you had a list of them. We only got I one. do, so. and, I, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I we, we ran across a concept or a, a practice called non-compete contracts, uh, post-employment uh, restrictions, and uh, did not believe that bill would be a controversial one as we started that, that bill started its way through the House basically uh, trying to define what a non-compete contract is. Um, if, you're, if you work for someone and you wanna leave that employment or you're fired, um, can you work in that related field? And there's areas of uh, proprietary information or trade secrets that you have to be sensitive about. But what we had found and why the bill was filed was there's been abuses of that. And you're finding that employers are putting employees under non-compete contracts that really don't have uh, proprietary information necessarily or trade secrets to protect and so it was coming down to a, a sandwich uh, shop could keep you from working at subway uh, restaurants it was coming to a truck driver that wouldn't be able to get a, find another uh, job as a truck driver or a pest control operator um, some of these jobs that the non-competes were being uh, and they would ask you to sign it after you accepted the job so you'd take your job you're happy to be there and then they'd ask you to sign a non-compete that restriction of qualified workforce is a concern in a state like ours where we want to see, we think the rising tide lifts all ships. Non-compete and free market really shouldn't be used in the same sentence. Uh, we found that there was a lot of opposition to that bill. Every uh, economic sector seems to use these in, in great or great, uh, at great length. And so there was a lot of hesitation. We were able to get uh, a limit to 12 months on non-competes and if uh, someone wants to pursue an employee under a non-compete and the employer who would be trying to enforce a non-compete through the courts were to fail, 
uh, they would be uh, required to pay the legal fees of the person that they were going after if, they, if, if it wasn't an enforceable non-compete. Those were the compromise provisions that happened, but I don't think that's a conversation that's finished. I think that there was a lot of attention brought to that, and you're going to see uh, a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of stories out there of abuses on non-competes that we've got to be paying attention to. In a right-to-work state where employers can hire and fire at will, uh, your ability to fill out a resume or circulate a job uh, application is, uh, is, is pretty important in that relationship. Um, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. What about medical marijuana? Yes, and, that, and I, I, we, you don't have enough of a show to talk about <laughs> medical marijuana, but I would just say this. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, there's regulatory climate you've got to create. There's uh, whether THC and marijuana can be uh, used for medicinal purposes. And I, look, I think that there was some great arguments made. We learned uh, from patients that say that, the, that their lives are improved and their ability to get off opiates and highly addictive narcotics or, or, um, or Oxycontin or Lortabs uh, using a different uh, pain therapy. It seems to be appropriate, but I'm a policymaker. I'm not a doctor. So it's hard for me to, to know what the right way to go. We had a bill that came out of a Health and Human Services Committee, and at the end of the day, the people that wanted medicinal marijuana didn't like the bill, and the people that don't like medicinal marijuana, they didn't like the bill either. So it was a bill that fell on its own weight. So here's, here's the problem that, that I see from, from my perspective. I looked at Madsen's bill. I looked at Vickers' bill. I thought each of them had some qualifications. But there's a, there's a tenant that was in the Madsen bill that said, basically, we are using, a, we are going to start a process that ignores a federal law that the federal government isn't enforcing. Yes. And so you're passing a law that's, that statutorily on a federal level stands on shaky ground because it's still a class it's, it's one narcotic. It's not even shaky. It's, it's against federal mm. law. Now you have other states that have done this and for a states rights guy it's, it's fun to see our state stepping forward and, and ignoring federal law. But you're asking the state of Utah to legalize something that is against the law federally. In the states that have done this um, if you, in Colorado, whatever, whatever way you purchase the, the marijuana, and they can do it recreationally as well as medicinally, mm -hmm. um, you can't deposit that in a bank, a federally insured bank, because it's against the federal law. So you have to have a whole new system for uh, banking Bitcoin. for this product. <laughs> Bitcoin. Yeah, Bit I guess Bitcoin, <laughs> who knows? So, I mean, a lot of unanswered questions. And the idea that, um, that Utah uh, would embrace this, it's a big ask. I think that if we were to do this, it's going to be incremental in terms of what we'd be feel okay uh, or confident being able to do. I think you'd need a very strong regulatory climate. But I'll tell you this, um, it's one of those things that Congress would really do well to uh, put some better parameters around medicinal marijuana or recognize it as such so you can have the clinical trials and you can have some of the traditional um, research done to determine if something's medicine or not. And we don't have that right now. Speaker Hughes, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's thank you for bringing us into your homes, allowing us to share what's important about Utah. Remember, local government is where your life happens. Be involved, be part of the conversation. We'll see you next week on the Canada Seat. If you'd like to share this video with your friends, well, you do that right here. If you would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you do that over here. If you'd like to interact with us on the county seat, that happens over here. If you want to watch the next episode of the county seat, you can catch it Saturday night at 11 or Sunday morning at 8.30 on ABC4, Good For Utah.